All right, so what this is describing is this is an early iteration of Bethlehem found on this Armana letter, exactly how the Book of Mormon declares it in Alma chapter 7, verse 10. And this is by the uh, second or third chapter of the Book of Mormon. We're yeah, it's talking really pages. quick. Within the Dead Seas, there was a scroll discovered. It's called the Temple Scroll. I wish there was an encyclopedia of all the failed anti-Mormon claims. Glory, glory, glory. It, it was written both in the Book of Mormon and in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we have archaeological evidence documenting something that Nephi is going to speak about. So this blows my mind. Pharaoh of Egypt here is literally talking about conquering these lands and these cities. Right when he came in, he declared a jubilee year. This dates all the way back to the mid 14th century BC. It's also something you can find in the biblical text. The following is an episode of Ward Radio and does not represent the thoughts or the opinions of KHTS, its owners, or any of its affiliates, nor does it represent the official opinion of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. With that said, sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. notice that this is like Dorito chip orange. I mean, this cuneiform tablet straight up looks like the Babylonian dude that was writing it was munching his Cheetos. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Ward Radio. I am your host, Cardinalis. Today, I'm joined in the studio by Josh Gailey, our archaeologist buddy from Penn State, as well as Jerry Grover, certified civil engineer, as well as linguist, bon vivant, man about town, average, just big brain, smart guy. And uh, today, we've got a super fun thesis that we are defending here. Josh is bringing to the table some evidence, archaeological evidence, that the first 34 pages of the Book of Mormon are indeed true. They really happened, and he has the receipts. Josh, Gailey, go. Well, one thing that's beautiful about the start of the Book of Mormon is within the first four verses, Nephi gives us a datum. So in an archaeological site, what I want everybody to picture is everybody's doing digs, you do little squares, and everybody's entrenching down, and when you dig the site, you're destroying the site, so you want to properly provenance everything that you're uncovering. So what you need is a center point. You need a datum point, a fixed point to say, hey, here's the beginning and we can map out the site from there. Everything falls under this datum. This is our known fixed point and we can map out the site and learn a lot about the In site Washington, from that. In Washington, D.C., here's yeah. the flagpole at the White House and everything we're going to measure from that distance feet. all okay, around. Cool. All right. Nephi gives us his datum at the start of the Book of Mormon. So in 1 Nephi 1.4, Nephi says, and this is the beginning, it says, For it came to pass in the commencement of the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, my father Lehi, having dwelt at Jerusalem in all his days, and in that same year there came many prophets prophesying unto the people that they must repent, or the great city Jerusalem must be destroyed. Here we have a place, the old city Jerusalem. We have a time the first year of the puppet king Zedekiah. So if you go to the first slide card cool. on the slideshow, there's going to be a map that shows Jerusalem at this time period. It is in the middle, and it has entrenched itself as this center point between an Egyptian empire, which it keeps trying to side with, instead of siding with the new cool empire, which is Babylon, that's trying to conquer and procure taxes and money from this area, the Levant. And then you have the old kingdom of Assyria, all right, up in the north. So Jerusalem is kind of like the armpit in between <laughs> uh, or, or center of trade, per se, yeah. or like this hub. Everything's going to flow through Jerusalem. My buddy was from Fresno, and he literally used to call it the armpit of California. Yeah. So now when you say that's Jerusalem, I just think Jerusalem was Fresno, and I, man. And I love <laughs> Jerusalem. But yeah. it, in this time period, in this context, it was literally this. It, it's it, You could draw a line from all three to each other, and it's right in the middle. Okay, yeah. so that's that's where, and so Babylon comes, does a siege of Jerusalem, uninstalls the king, replaces the king with King Zedekiah. Uninstalls, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's basically like Nebuchadnezzar saying, you will pay your taxes. Yeah. You will, no, no, you will uh, yeah. pay your taxes. <laughs> 
<laughs> and Zedekiah doesn't, and then they get destroyed again. Okay, so like any proof that libertarianism is a completely modern construct, there's you know King Zedekiah, but taxation is theft. You know what I'm saying? So if you go to the second slide, you'll get a picture of the old city just to give some co context. There was probably cool. about twenty thousand people living there around this time, give or take. And you see the the temple that's up top. This is actually a reconstruction that looks real similar to what the the city that Nephi and Lehi knew in the land of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem would have looked like. So you have the the higher walls, that's the old city of Jerusalem. And what you're looking at there is this aerial and there's this big rectangle of the smaller walls that like somebody like a, uh, a Hezekiah in Isaiah would have built and constructed to expand and, and rebuild the city. So that's all relevant and, and good because that's the city they would have known. This is the place they would have gone back to to get the plates. We have a fixed point at a fixed time through first Nephi because of Nephi getting us launched off in the right way. And the Babylonian Chronicles describe the destruction of Jerusalem. So there are these little tablets. There, there are these little clay. And if you go to the next slide card, and what yeah. you're going to see is this is tiny. Okay. It looks like there's a lot on there, but it's like just two inches by three inches. I mean, this could have fit in the palm of your hand. And this little, uh, they call it a Babylonian Chronicle, but it, it says, the, the quote on it is, from the archaeological record, this chronicle says, in the seventh month of Nebuchadnezzar, in the month of Chislev, the king of Babylon assembled his army and he laid siege to the city of Judah. So we have archaeological evidence documenting something that Nephi is going to speak about, it's going to be prophesied of, and eventually Lehi is going to confirm that takes place. So we we know, um, and it, this one in particular is talking about the first siege because it says he installed, this is Nebuchadnezzar, he installed in his place a king, Zedekiah, of his own choice. And after he received rich tribute, he sent them to Babylon. So wow. this is talking about the installment that's described in first, you know, first Nephi one four. So this blows my mind. My first impression for those that are listening on the radio, you have got to look up, quote, the city of David, end quote, and see uh, kind of modern reconstructions. Believe it or not, I was developing still am. But when I was in the phase of trying to develop a map for the ancient city of Jerusalem for those first chapters of the Book of Mormon, I'm making a video game of that, actually. It was pretty hard to try and find a consensus map of what the ancient 600 BC city of Jerusalem look like. There's, they all generally have like, you know, the city of David, that long little peninsula on the bottom that kind of looks like Florida on the United States of America, you know. But it's pretty amazing actually how small it was. Yeah. As just like, sure. uh, what would you have called it back then? A nation state? Does that work? Uh, it's a city state. Sure. Oh, sorry, city that's what state. I meant. It was a yeah. city state. Yeah. Definitely was. Yeah. And um, nowadays, of course, I mean, they're they're finding outer walls when they dig down to like build new ones because the city's been leveled and, you know, subject to conquest 13, 14, 15, 16 times. They've lost all the boundaries over time. But 600 BC Jerusalem was not a very big place. Place. Yeah, and, and the kings of Jerusalem kept making the same mistake. Okay, politically, you know, there's obviously the spiritual side, the prophecies from Ezekiel, the prophecies of Lehi, the prophecies of Jeremiah, but they kept making the same mistake. And the basic mistake was, you know, we are siding with Egypt and Egypt will protect us, you know, and we're not going to pay our taxes to Babylon. And, and that was, you know, there was obviously spiritual reasons for the destruction as prophesied, uh -huh. but the political reasons is, they aligned themselves with the wrong empire and Egypt was waning. It, it couldn't protect them. And Babylon was the growing. It, it was the victor in all this. OK, so, yeah. wow. Come at the king. You better not miss. Pick the wrong empire. Woo! Yeah. You know what I'm saying? For <laughs> they, sure. They might come For and sure. make you pay your taxes and uninstall your king. That's one way of putting it. All right. Keep going, Josh. So Lehi prophesies he's rejected. He's warned by the Lord. Right. And heavenly experience to leave okay and and flee they travel three days in jerusalem from jerusalem down and we you know follow up and down with the elevation and this is by the uh, second or third chapter of the book of mormon we're yeah it's talking really pages quick five it's really seven. quick okay, yeah. yeah even in even we're really in chapter two oh, okay because okay. in first nephi chapter two six and seven they leave and uh when they 
finally reach their destination. So they're traveling at least three days and then probably a little bit beyond that. They reach their destination at the Red Sea and it talks about the sacrifices. You know, Lehi pitches his tent. They kind of set up camp and then they perform some sacrifices based on the Old Testament and and to follow the Mosaic law. Okay, so they're following actually some of the laws in Leviticus of a peace offering, thanking God for safety of journey and some of those things. But when they do that, there's what what's interesting is some people used to jump at this and say, wait, wait, wait a second. You know, you're just how can Lehi offer sacrifices when he's that close to the temple? You know, you should be offering anybody should be offering sacrifices at the temple. Everybody knows this, right? Well, then within the Dead Seas, there was a scroll discovered. It's called the Temple Scroll. So if you hit up the next slide, okay, I'm you're going to see an image of not the exact text from the Temple Scroll, but a, a public domain uh, picture of part of the Temple Scroll. Yes. And so within that, the Temple Scroll said this. It says it, um, it's the relevant passage is from 11QT, and also a, a different way would be 11Q19, 52, 13 through 15. It reads this way. Uh, the translation is, you shall not slaughter a clean ox or sheep or goat in all your towns near to my temple within a distance of three days journey. Nay, but inside my temple, you shall slaughter it, making a burnt offering or a peace offering. And this is also referencing some scriptures from Deuteronomy. Yeah. So this temple scroll unveiled a rule that dates before Christ. Okay, and the rule, and it's probably pretty easy for us to project that back to Lehi and Nephi's yeah. day, the unwritten rule being, and it actually, well, it, it was written both in the Book of Mormon and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the rule was, hey, you need to be, if you're within three days, basically, if you're within a week's journey of Jerusalem traveling out, you need to be able to come back to offer your sacrifices. Nephi specifically tells us we were three days away. Yeah. And then we offer sacrifice. He's saying, Nephi's basically saying, I know you know this rule, even though we didn't. And and we followed it. I just want you to know we followed the rules. Yeah. And what's so interesting is I wish there was an encyclopedia of all the failed anti-Mormon claims. Because a lot of what we do on Ward Radio is debunking a lot of, you know, the the toxic Exmo anti-Mormon claims. You know, uh, there's a lot of uh, Protestant, Protestant evangelical anti-Mormons out there. They kind of uh, rehash a lot of, you know, old arguments and it, it kind of seems to recycle itself. Um, so it, it's funny to see the ones that get recycled, but it's also funny to see the ones that go away. And I wish there was an encyclopedia of of all of the attacks against the book of mormon both philosophical and archaeological that they've dropped because one of them used to be this when you read old anti-mormon books from the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and so on and so forth before the dead sea scrolls were discovered there was so much chatter about oh this is abs this is pseudo history there's no way this is real the ancient jews never would have allowed lehi to build an altar and make his own sacrifices that would have been anathema you know like they just they just completely dogged it enter the Dead Sea Scrolls, and not only was it a possibility, it was practically a commandment, you know, to do it, not just kind of how Lehi did it, to the T how he did it, and we completely discovered an entire new, I don't want to say race, but like sect of ancient Jews, the Essenes, that who knows, he could have been one of those, not just a Pharisee or a Sadducee, well, that, one of the... The Essenes come later, but... Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. we birthed. Uh, you're right. Okay. So I'm not saying that correctly, but I'm just saying we didn't know until we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls about them. Correct. Although there's right. an about this rule, about this this cultural rule. For yes. This, for those following the Mosaic Law. So it is it is amazing. It's an amazing discovery. Jerry, anything else on the timing of the departure? That. Um, yeah, a couple things. Um, what you're also seeing in the Book of Mormon is some biblical typology going on, meaning. Um, the departure and everything is mirroring Exodus, things related to Moses, right? Rock yeah. on. It, which is not apparent if you're just like reading it superficially. But the three days, for example, Moses asked Pharaoh that he could go three days into the wilderness to offer sacrifice. Right, right. So it's, <laughs> it's just, a good point. Yeah. And so you also have like three days travel from the Red Sea to Mara, their, one of their stops, you know. So, and then the other thing, like Lehi. The interesting thing is that Zedekiah, actually, right when he came in, he declared 
a jubilee year, which most people don't know what that is, but it goes back to the Exodus. The uh, what, 50th year, right after seven sabbatical terms. Yeah, 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 49. And so, but in that year, they would do pilgrimages to their land of their inheritance. And so you have um, Lehi leaving, coming out of Jerusalem, going to the land of his inheritance, presumably, because we know he had a different property because when they went back to get the silver and gold, et cetera, yeah. it was there. And so and then he, so it's interesting that he has a pilgrimage just like you would expect in a Jubilee year. Now Zedekiah reneged and because he freed the slaves and then they weren't freed. So yeah. he was condemned by Jeremiah for it. But so you're actually seeing even, you know, consistency with the biblical text of what Lehi is doing. You also kind of see these other typologies starting to to play in this early part of the Book of Mormon, the departure, right? Yeah, that's cool. So rock on. That's awesome. Okay, sick. So we got Temple Scroll Q, uh, Q11 handled. Hit it. Keep going, Josh. So even just staying there in chapter two, there's a phrase that comes up that's kind of new. Okay. And when I say new, it's the first time we ever hear it. This is not a biblical phrase. But Nephi offers and suggests the phrase in First Nephi 2.11. And why don't you pull that up? Why don't we look at that? He's going to say that the, you know, Lehi's a visionary uh, man. He had led them out of the land of Jerusalem. Now, this is a phrase versus like in the Book of Mormon across many different places. We have cities. You have the city bountiful and you have an associated land bountiful. Okay, you have the, you know, the city of Zarahemla and you have the associated land Zarahemla. So this is a Book of Mormon thing. It's also something you can find in the biblical text. You just don't find it about Jerusalem. You don't read in okay. the Old Testament. You, you'll read about the city Jerusalem in the scriptures, but you're not going to read about the land of Jerusalem. Is this where all the anti-Mormons get this whole claim about like, oh, who actually believes that this happened in the land of Jerusalem? Well, yeah, because we get it seven. This isn't just Nephi alone. Seven different times in the Book of Mormon, it uses the phrase the land of Jerusalem. And even one time in Alma 710, it's specifically referencing Bethlehem. And it's basically saying Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, which is the land of our fathers. So it's it's talking about Bethlehem being within the landscape of Jerusalem. And that's always been a critique of the Book of Mormon within the text. So you have these seven different accounts. But then over time, people have been reading the archaeological record and been finding some really exciting things. So again, these tablets end up being really important there's an Armana letter, and that when it says letter, that's really a clay tablet. All right, so that's okay. that's our next image up on the screen after the temple scroll. Rock on. And for anybody that's re, uh, listening to this on the radio, this image we got going on here is basically a cuneiform tablet, I think we could yeah. say. These writings, they're talking and they're describing about the rulers of Canaanite city-states, with, and it's describing you know, that are under the Pharaoh of Egypt. He, The Pharaoh of Egypt here is literally talking about conquering these lands and these cities, okay? And this dates all the way back to the mid-14th century B.C. These are old, okay? So these include, uh, uh, well, let me let me read it, okay? Let me read what the... Be honest, you just reading the cuneiform or are you doing a translation <laughs> like a wimp? I cannot read cuneiform if you paid me, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> But it basically, in one of the letters, there's multiple of these. It says, Behold, the king, referencing the king of Egypt, has set his name in the land of Jerusalem forever. So he cannot abandon the lands of Jerusalem. So it's an archaeological evidence, and this even predates Book of Mormon times, that number one, Jerusalem exists. That's cool. That it's super, super old and early. That's really cool. Because that's all. I mean, David conquers Jerusalem, right? So it's it's a city that predates David. So there's a lot of evidence here that's even biblical evidence for the text, which is nice. But then it's even referencing the fact that this had a land attached to it. So that's that's really interesting. Right. So then we go to the next one and we have uh, a Buya, you know, one of those clay seals that it this is referencing. Now we're going to get into Alma 710, which is describing the fact that uh, Jesus would be born at Bethlehem in the land of Jerusalem. Okay, which is in born at Bethlehem in Jerusalem, which is the land of our fathers, is the way it's phrased. And this uh, this clay, you're looking here at a clay seal, when, and clay seals would be used. There, there's something that would have 
an impression given on it to basically certify documents and who was the author of the document that was floating around. Yeah, okay. Okay, so this is something that's 2700 years old okay and it describe and it's uh it was found in the city of david so in the you described the peninsula of florida that we were looking at on the map within that peninsula within that city of david that excavation in jerusalem they found one of these it was 2007 years old now 2700 years old which again we're landing right in book of mormon timeline now with this and it contains the name of bethlehem and confirms that it's paying taxes to Jerusalem. So what makes something within the land of something else? Um, what makes something... Erie, Erie, the city of Erie or the city of Los Angeles is in the land of America. Why? It pays taxes to America. If, yes. it, if it paid taxes to Toronto, it would be a Canadian city. Well, and you know? the funny part of Los Angeles, too, is that that's the name of the city and the county. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like there's even another kind of modern example of how something can be called Los Angeles twice, like New York City. It's uh, the the city's so great they named it twice, right? You know. And another one of these clay tablets on the very next slide, we have the Armana letter number two ninety. This even refers to Bethlehem. So this is incredible. So look at this this quote. Now, um, there are critics that are Book of Mormon critics that have looked at this and said this isn't Bethlehem. But when every biblical archaeologist that deals with this data says this is a translation of Bethlehem, you, you have to go with the current data. Otherwise, you're just being kind of a priori biased. Okay, so here's, okay. here's it says, but now even a town of the land of Jerusalem, Bit Lami, by name, a town belonging to the king, has gone over to the side of the people in uh, Kiela. All right, so what this is describing is this is an early iteration of Bethlehem found on this Armana letter, and it references the fact that Bethlehem is within the land of Jerusalem, exactly how the Book of Mormon declares it in Alma chapter 7, verse 10. Okay, and that was this. That's this, the orangey looking one. Oh, this one right here. Okay, yeah. I'd had the wrong one up on the screen. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's great. Interesting. Okay. Wow, so this is the first written example of... These are the first early examples of probably any evidence for Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And it's clearly representing the fact that Jerusalem was a city that had enough power and prestige around it that there were other tributaries paying taxes to them, and it's there's a land associated within this territory. Wow, that is intriguing. Does anybody else notice that this is like dorito chip orange i mean this cuneiform tablet straight up looks like the babylonian dude that was writing it was munching his cheetos you know what i'm saying <laughs> while he was in he was getting cheeto any of us that have kids know exactly what the little chunks of goldfish and cheerios look like in between the car seats and everybody else knows exactly what uh cheeto powder looks like and this cuneiform tablet is uh, strangely cheeto power uh, Cheeto powdered <laughs> colored. No, Cheeto powder colored. There we go. Okay. Josh, keep going before I dig a deeper hole. No, don't <laughs> dig a deeper hole. Open up a bag and pass it over, brother. Yeah, rock on. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So just two other artifacts I think are cool. There, Listen, there's thousands that we could look at because the, uh, the siege of Jerusalem associated with Nebuchadnezzar is well attested in the archaeological record. So the next picture that we have is just a, a impression done on a piece of, of clay that would be like uh, mounted in some stuff in Babylon that identifies Nebuchadnezzar. So he's a known name with an archaeology that is just common. It, okay. His reign is, is well documented, so there's no really no controversy with that at all. And the last slide is just evidence. There's a tip of a spear that has been excavated that's attributed to in the land of Jerusalem to the siege that that uh, Nephi talks about and Lehi prophesies of. So. Okay. And for anybody that's listening on the radio, we're actually going to be putting all of the links to any of these visuals and so on and so forth on wardradio.com. We'll probably put it up um, also in the descriptions on the video if you want to check us out on YouTube as well. So um, so that arrowhead, some... the fancy way to say it, Cardin, not to, sorry, but it's, yeah. it's called, so that would be a, a Scythian type of arrowhead found in the destruction layer of Jerusalem from like the 587, 586 B.C destruction timeline so wow awesome by the way have you ever held one of these in your hand for real no i have not i've never been stabbed by one either okay um 
I got to tell you, the Scythian arrowheads were savage. Apparently, because I was in Jerusalem and they were selling a bunch. You can pick one up, like a solid one yeah, for they're 500 for sale bucks. Online. They're, they're pretty common. Yeah, they're yeah, pretty they're, common. So. Exactly. Similar to like widow's mites and to maybe Herodian lamps. It's kind of one of those entry level antiquities that you can pick up. They're pretty cool. Awesome to show your friends. Not that we ever would. We never would. No, pick them but. up as in purchase them legally through an antiquities dealer and broker. Or watch them in a museum. Or I mean. look at them in a museum for the people. Yes. So um, after stolen from an artificial <laughs> and illegal dig. Thank no, you. I'm just kidding. So um, if you ever hold these things. What's amazing is how sharp some of them still are. Okay. That was wild. I remember thinking, holy smoke. That's they, cool. they found the outer wall of Jerusalem, the old outer wall. And one of the ways that they were able to identify it was by the Scythian arrowheads that they were finding at the base of the wall. And also- That makes sense. Yeah. These are the first- uh, You can't siege against a wall unless you know where the wall is, right? And arrowheads are going to fall right there. That, yes, that exactly. That absolutely makes sense. Yeah. So um, I was able to hold in my hand some of the Scythian arrowheads from the base of the uh, the old Jerusalem wall, which is pretty thick. It's probably like, I'd say, almost 20 feet thick practically, okay? And no joke, the archaeologist was explaining to me, what do you notice about these in comparison to these arrowheads? And he showed some that were maybe 100 years older. And he said, these ones were meant so that if you tried to pull them out, the arrowhead would pop off inside of your flesh and oh. would fester. And so they were these tri-tip Scythian arrowheads that were designed so that if you got shot by the arrow, instead of being able to pull it out and then kind of keep fighting like a BA Viking in like, I don't know, Netflix late at night, you actually would pull it out and it would pop off the shaft and leave the arrowhead inside your thigh. I mean, that is some savage Woo. ancient warfare stuff right there. And so the fact some of these were still sharp and they were made to pop off in the middle of your leg or in the middle of your chest, I thought, man, whoever these Scythians were, I want to be a million miles away. I'll pay my taxes to you, bro. Just keep those arrowheads, <laughs> keep those arrowheads away That's from the me idea. and my friends. That's you know? the idea. It's like, I'll give you my taxes, mate. Can we keep it below 54.3% where, you know, the state of California has us in the marginal bracket? No promises. Know, no promises. No promises. Yeah. All right. So anyway, this has been totally awesome. I love this evidence. People that say, uh, you know, there's no archaeological evidence for the Book of Mormon. In or the, words, the Bible. And this, I mean, a lot of evidence here for the Bible. I mean, yeah. You just can't take that claim seriously because they forget that the first 34 pages of the Book of Mormon don't happen in the New World, but actually happen in the Old. So awesome. This has been great. I feel satiated. For this and more, guys, please check us out at wardradio.com.